there are uh, mitigating circumstances. Uh, and I'll get into that a, a little bit later as well. Uh, but it, it's a decision that's, that's met, then made collectively. Uh, a recommendation is made in our case to the Attorney General. Uh, it, at the county level, a recommendation would be made to the, the county attorney who, who then would have the final say on whether to seek death in any given case. Uh, one thing that I find somewhat troubling, uh, that, and there's, there's nothing I, I think that certainly that I, that I can do about it at this point, it, it's, it's a little bit frustrating that we have disparities throughout the state in terms of how the death penalty is administered. We have counties in which uh, the death penalty is never sought. Uh, and given that we have a, a state statute, from my perspective, it would be a better system if there were more, uh, if there were more consistency in, in how, how the death penalty was sought and applied throughout the state. Uh, that being said, we have a system where we, we elect local county attorneys, and, and I suppose the benefit of that system is those, those elected officials are more responsive to the, to the electorate, and, and they're the ones who are ultimately charged with with making the decision. Uh, we, do have, we do have a very collaborative working relationship throughout the state with the different county attorneys. The county attorneys have a group uh, that's called uh, the, Associ the Association of Pros the, the APAC. It's the advisory council for, uh, for prosecutors throughout the state. And we, we work together, uh, share ideas, uh, bounce ideas off each other. And, and so I think there is some, some level of collaboration. But at, at present, we have a system where the ultimate decision where to seek, whether to seek death is made by an elected county attorney. Uh, I, I guess before, before going on, I do want to, I do want to address one, one point that I, I strongly disagreed with with Mr. Clemency's presentation, and that was the, uh, the assertion that race plays a part in, the, in carrying out the death penalty and in the charging decision. Uh, we, we've had, we had a capital commission in Arizona, as I indicated, in 2001, and, and we've kept statistics uh, from the time we've implemented the death penalty in Arizona. And if you look in Arizona, you simply cannot make the case that racial minorities are treated poorly in terms of being more likely to be executed. Uh, in fact, Arizona's death row has, uh, white males have been overrepresented on Arizona's death row for a long time. The statistics simply do not support an allegation uh, that you're more likely to get the death penalty if you're a racial minority. Uh, once, once all those statistics became very clear, the next argument advanced was, well, it matters, the race of the victim matters. And, and I agree that there are statistics that show that there is, there is more of a likelihood if the victim is Caucasian that the death penalty will be imposed than if the victim is, uh, is African American or is Hispanic. Uh, but there, there are reasons for that and it's not clear that that's evidence of invidious discrimination or any discrimination at all. Um, it, to, to really do a thorough analysis of that statistic, you need to, you need to look at what type, the, the circumstances of the crime. There, there's some crimes where the state doesn't seek death penalty that don't have anything to do with the, the race of the victim or the race of the defendant. For example, if there's a gang murder, one gang member kills another gang member. It, it's a case that, where it's very unlikely that the state is going to seek the death penalty. The, the, witness, the, the victims are not perceived as being sympathetic. Uh, sometimes they're harder to track down. It, it's, you will find throughout Arizona and throughout other states in the country that those types of crimes, uh, the death penalty is not sought. And it doesn't matter if it's a white gang member killing another white gang member or a black gang member killing another black gang member. Uh, but the, the, the reality is that the statistics are skewed if you have more members of a racial minority involved in, uh, in gang murders, for example. Uh, if, if, if you're involved in, if, if the murder involves the sale of drugs, you're, you're sometimes less likely, the, the prosecution has to make the decision on how credible witnesses are, and, and the, the facts and circumstances of the offense dictate uh, to a great extent whether death will be sought, and those circumstances are, are generally unrelated to the, uh, to the race of the victim or the race of the, the defendant. So I, I, I strongly disagree. Uh, certainly, there, there's simply no basis for arguing that, 
the race of the defendant is a determining factor. Uh, when, when we say if a black person kills a Caucasian person, there, there are also reasons why it's more likely uh, that, that there will be a, a death penalty that's sought. If a family member kills another family member, whether you're Caucasian or African American, those types of murders don't generally result or are less likely to result in a death penalty. If it's a stranger murder, and so it's going to be more likely that it's a stranger murder if it's an African American, uh, it's not going to be a stranger murder or there's a chance, at least if you're killing a family member, the race is going to be the same. Uh, so there, there are explanations like that that at least ex explain to a certain extent the, the statistic about the, the race of the victim being significant. Um, and from my experience in sitting on these panels that make the decision on whether, whether to seek death and in, in talking to prosecutors throughout the state, um, I, I simply have not seen any evidence that, that, that there's any kind of indication, oh, the victim in this case is Caucasian, let's seek the death penalty. That, that simply it has not been my experience and, and I, do, I don't think the, the statistics will, uh, will bear that out, that, it's, that there's a discriminatory rationale uh, on the part of prosecutors in, in seeking the death penalty. Uh, certainly there are, uh, there are considerations about how sympathetic a, a victim is. And when, when you have, I don't like to ever say that a victim is not innocent, but in a, a victim in a, a drug deal gone bad is just not perceived as being as innocent as, as, other, as other victims. And it's, it's simply the reality of, of what we look at um, as, as prosecutors. Uh, we, we have these statutory aggravating circumstances, uh, but there's also kind of a, a gut level feel. Um, from my perspective, what enters into my mind is how afraid am I of, of this person? Uh, a good example of that would be the, uh, the Poland brothers who've been executed for uh, killing two armored car drivers and dumping the bodies in, in Lake Mead. Uh, what, what I found particularly scary about these two brothers, uh, they, they weren't necessarily scary people to meet on the street, but they posed as police officers, as highway patrolmen, and pulled over, some, pulled over these, uh, these armored car drivers uh, and then uh, killed them and dumped the bodies in Lake Mead. And, and for me now, when I'm pulled over by a police officer, that, that's in the back of my mind. It's, it's something that you, that you worry about. And so there, there are factors that, that you certainly weigh in. How, uh, how, how afraid are we of someone? How dangerous is someone? Uh, but that's, it's secondary to, first, you, there, have, there has to be an aggravating circumstance. Uh, and, and the Poland brothers, incidentally, were both Caucasian from, uh, from Yavapai County. Uh, the, the argument against the death penalty, I think, is difficult to make uh, for one, for a simple reason that I think was best articulated by a professor from NYU that I, I heard speak several years ago, a professor by the name of Robert Blecker. And he said, growing up, I always knew that Adolf Hitler deserved the death penalty. The only question for me was who else deserved it? And, and I think that's, that is the, the primary argument uh, in favor of the death penalty. It's hard to, it's hard to say that the, mor the death penalty is morally reprehensible or morally wrong if you're going to say that Hitler deserves the death penalty. Uh, we make the same argument now, does Osama bin Laden deserve the death penalty? Uh, and if you're going to say yes, and, and the overwhelming majority of, of citizens in our country and in our state have said yes, then it is a question of well, where do you draw the line? Uh, if, I were a king, if I were king for the day, I, I might draw the line differently than, than some of the county attorneys. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it, it doesn't make it a morally reprehensible decision by, by this elected official. Once, once you get over that hurdle of saying there are some people, there are some crimes so serious that the person who commits that crime has forfeited their right to live in society. And I, I, I disagree with the assertion that this is some sort of revenge on the part of the, the community. Uh, I, I think when, generally when we think of revenge, we think of the victim, of so, someone who's been personally injured, uh, goes after someone who has harmed them. And, and that, that's not how our death penalty system works uh, here in Arizona or anywhere in the United States. The decision to seek death is not made by the victim. 
Uh, the prosecution does seek input from the victim, but there, there are a lot of victims who are opposed to the death penalty, and the prosecution nevertheless decides to seek death. The, the decision to seek death is made by, uh, I, I think you can refer to a dispassionate third party. It's not the party that was, uh, that was ne necessarily injured. It's someone who speaks for the community. And I think that's very different than saying that, that this is a revenge uh, or we're somehow satisfying our bloodlust. It's simply carrying out the law that has been enacted and, and trying to do so as fairly and even-handedly as, as possible. Um, I, I think I gave some kind of quote. I, I don't remember writing what, uh, what was read. I don't want to give the impression that we think there's no, I think there's no problem with the death penalty. Uh, there, there certainly are concerns, and, and I don't mean to convey that our office can make sure that the death penalty works fine in Arizona. It's uh, what, I, what I would like to suggest is that my experience in working with prosecutors around the state is that there are, they are people of high integrity who are trying to do the right thing. Certainly at the Attorney General's office, it's been my experience that the people who, who work on these cases <coughs> are, are interested in, in making sure that, uh, that it, it's done properly. If there are valid claims, we can confess error. Uh, we don't confess error very frequently, but it's an option that's available to us. Uh, we, we, do take, we do take this very seriously. Uh, so, so I guess my, my primary response to all of the, the reasons given for not having the death penalty, uh, the reasons against, is simply that those are not the reasons that we have the death penalty. We, we have the death penalty because we've, we've decided that there, there are crimes that, that warrant the, the imposition of this, of this penalty. Uh, when we talk about, uh, I, I tend to agree with the discussion about closure. We, we never tell victims um, you're going to get closure when someone is executed. It, it is a very long appellate process, and you certainly don't want someone to put their life on hold, uh, waiting through the ups and downs of the, of the appellate process. But I, I don't, closure, I don't think, is the reason we have it. We, we have it because this, this crime warrants this, this response. Uh, and again, if, if you polled the public now, I think there's probably 90% support for uh, executing someone like Osama bin Laden, uh, Timothy McVeigh, uh, Adolf Hitler, people who've committed those types of crimes. And it is, uh, it, it's, a little, it's a different question if you came down and there, there may be some other people on death row who there, there's a difference of a, agreement on. But it's, once you've made that decision, it is a question of where are you going to draw the line and then can you apply it fairly. Uh, there was <clears throat> some discussion about the cost of the death penalty, and I don't think we have the death penalty because it's cheaper to, uh, to execute people. I, I agree that it's very expensive. Uh, I, I don't think there's been a definitive study that shows the expense. Uh, under Janet Napolitano, we, we hired a consultant as part of our capital commission to, to analyze the cost of the death penalty in Arizona, and the initial conclusion was uh, was that it's not necessarily more expensive to have the death penalty, that the costs of incarceration as, as you have an aging prison population and the, <laughs> the health care costs that, are, uh, that in, are incurred as people age, uh, I, I don't know that there's a compelling argument that it is less expensive or more expensive to have, have the death penalty. Uh, and again, from my perspective, that's, it, it's still a choice that we're going to make, I, I think, regardless of the, of the cost. Uh, I don't think there's any statistical analysis of the precise costs in Arizona. We, we came close in, in going through some of the initial costs, uh, but, but there has not been a definitive study, certainly in Arizona, of, uh, of the cost of, of carrying out the process. And the process is carried out for the most part by state agencies. <laughs> and uh, I think most of the attorneys at my office would, would disagree with the assertion that we're, we're well compensated. Um, it's, it, it tends to be, uh, it, it is government, government service. I think our, our attorneys are there because they, they believe that we're, we're actually serving the public with what we're doing and it's, even though they could probably make, and they most certainly could make significantly more money uh, in private practice. Uh, most, of the, most of the cost is borne by, by these state agencies. And, it, and it's not necessarily clear to me that there would be a huge savings uh, if we just moved to a system of life without possibility of parole. There's, there's certainly 
if, if death is taken off the table, there are certainly extensive appeals, experts that are brought in in cases where, where someone is facing life without the possibility of parole. Uh, and, and from my perspective, it, it kind of highlights, uh, I guess, my view of whether it's productive to, to oppose the death penalty. <clears throat> like I say, from my, from my standpoint, from my perspective, uh, I, I think we can still have an ordered, ordered society without the death penalty. Uh, I wouldn't lose any sleep if the legislature came in this year and decided not to have the death penalty. Uh, there, there still would be work uh, for me in my office. Uh, But I think the, uh, so I, I, I really think that, that cost is, is not the right way of, of looking at it. Is it really costing that much money? And, and I guess, I, sorry, I lost my train of thought. The, from my perspective, it would be just as, I'm not saying just as bad, but I, I would find it morally reprehensible to convict someone and have them serve a life sentence if, if they're innocent. Um, as certainly executing them uh, it would be would be horrific, uh, but it would it would also be horrible to imprison someone uh, unnecessarily or for a crime that they did not commit. And from my perspective, the the energy is better devoted to ways to improve the criminal justice system in general, as opposed to a, a particular debate about the death penalty. Not that I, I think the debate is is healthy, it's useful, and we should continue to have it.